we have been this past month learning about the Holy Spirit. And I think it's been a, a very um, excellent and timely sermon series. Uh, we've been, uh, it's, it's been called Spirit Filled. And how many know that it's important that we be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? We are a church that believes in the Spirit of God. We're a church that uh, prays that the Spirit of God would move in our lives. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we believe uh, that the Spirit inside of us is moving and that God is doing something. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. We've been learning about uh, the role of the Holy Spirit and how important he is in our lives as born-again believers. That uh, the Holy Spirit, what he does is he compels us to Christ. He draws us closer to Christ. And every aspect of our walk uh, is influenced by the Holy Spirit. It's unfortunate, though, that sometimes uh, the Holy Spirit can be overlooked. There was a article in the Christian Post this past September, and it was based on a study from Arizona Christian University. And the title of the article said this. It says, most adult U.S. Christians don't believe the Holy Spirit is real. Can you imagine that? That article was, in a sense, talking about that uh, more so people have a religion than an actual relationship uh, with God. And it was saying that some 62% of self-identified born-again Christians contend that the Holy Spirit is not real, is not a real living being, but merely a symbol of God's power, presence, or purity. I believe that that 62% is a 62% that doesn't read their Bible is the 62% that has yet to experience a move of God in their lives. Because when you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, when you have the presence of God at work within your life, uh, you know that the Spirit of God is real. You know that he is active. Uh, the Bible says it's, uh, that uh, he puts that fire that's stirred up in your bones that makes you passionate uh, for the things of God, that excites you for the things of God, that when you are reading your word or in time of prayer, it's the Spirit of God ministering to you. Holy Spirit, he empowers us. He's God within us. Uh, he anoints us. He quickens us. Uh, and in every dimension of our lives, there's nothing that he doesn't touch on. Nothing that we do as Christians is exempt from his guidance or his direction or his leading. He's more than just our conscience. He's God that's inside of us and he deals with us. He convicts us of sin and helps us to get past it. And it's a shame when we would grieve him when we are in rebellion towards God. He is our comforter when we're suffering. He's our help in times of trouble. He's our advocate and our counselor when we're seeking guidance or direction for our lives. And we need direction and guidance for our lives. As parents, fathers or mothers, we need guidance in how to raise our children, especially in this day and age. As spouses, as husbands or wives, we need the direction of God for our marriage. We need the direction of God for our lives when it comes to our destiny and the call of God upon each and every one of us. We need the Spirit's guidance. Entitled this message, As the Spirit Leads. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 27, It says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. God, the promise that God has given us to give us his Holy Spirit, uh, that we can be sensitive to the spirit of God as he leads us and as he directs us. It's, he's much more than just a, a power or a force as some people believe, but it's God living inside of us. What an awesome thing 
to know that God can dwell inside of you and I. Amen. Book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 26. There's times in our lives where we're seeking wisdom or we're seeking understanding or guidance and direction, and we might come to a place in our, in our prayer or in our lives where we just we need that extra. God, what is it you're trying to show me? What is it you're trying to teach me, God? Which direction should I go? I want to be in your will. And, and we might come to a place where we might not know what to pray or how to pray. This is where the Spirit of God comes and he ministers to us. And in Romans 8.26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's so important that we have our, our prayer language, that we pray in the Spirit, because there are times uh, where we might not have the answer, we might not have that clear-cut direction, but when God is on the inside, uh, and he, he knows what's going on, and He knows what's troubling us, and He knows uh, that some of the decisions that we might have to make, uh, He begins to intercede for us, and He begins to lead us and prompt us in the direction in which we should go. And as we spend time in prayer, and as we spend time in His presence, He begins to reveal and confirm the direction we should be going in our lives. As we're praying, the Spirit of God is revealing to us the mind of Christ, the mind of God, which is so important for each and every one of us. That's why the Bible stresses that we become sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that we be receptive and responsive to Him, that we be obedient to the Spirit of God when He's dealing with us, when He's guiding us and leading us. And as we surrender our lives and as we surrender our will to the Spirit of God, to God, uh, you know what happens is the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to manifest, manifest itself in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know about you, but a lot of these things that I just mentioned, they don't come natural we want to believe that it does, but it takes the power of the Holy Spirit uh, working and changing in our lives that we become more loving, that we become more gentle, that we become more patient, that we become more self-controlled. That there's more, less of us and more of Him at work. We hear that saying, as the Spirit leads and oftentimes it's associated with maybe like worship or a worship service. You know, we're going to worship for five minutes or ten minutes or half an hour, an hour as the Spirit leads. But much more than just how He leads us in our worship, but it's how He leads us in our lives. It's how He leads us as born-again men and women. It's how He leads us uh, when we're confronted with struggle or we're confronted with any kind of affliction. It's how He leads us in our Christian walk. One of the things that the, one of the areas that the Spirit of God will lead us is in, is in the area of holiness. The Spirit leads us to holiness. Holiness will di distinguish a believer. It's what separates a believer from, from others. A lot of people like to think themselves spiritual. They'll say things like, I don't believe in God, but I, but I am spiritual, which makes no sense, right? Or, you know, I don't go to church, and I don't maybe believe in religion, but I do consider myself spiritual. You have, in these past uh, years, seen an increase in New Age teachings and Eastern philosophies and these esoteric practices, uh, and it gives people this false sense of spirituality, but what in a sense they have done is they've hijacked spirituality. They hijack words like peace. They hijack words like love. Love, love, right? Love is love. But you know what they can't hijack? It's holiness. Because holiness comes from God. Holiness is of God. The book of 1 Peter Chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. It says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, the way you behave, the way you carry yourself, your character. 
because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Holiness, uh, righteousness, it doesn't come natural. It's from God. It, it's not something that's in or within ourselves. Uh, it's something that God uh, does within our lives. And, and what that word holiness means, it means set apart. It means separate, different, or distinct, or dedicated. God's Holy Spirit, he leads us to leave, live these lives that are distinct from the world, that are separate from the world. Uh, we're consecrated. We're sanctified, the Bible says. We're holy unto him, fit for the master's use. Think about that, that God wants to use you and I, that he desires to use uh, you and I, and that should be the song and the prayer of every believer, that God, you would use me. We, we used to sing that song, right? If you could use anything, Lord, you can use me. Let me remind us man, that there, it's a privilege to be used by God. It's a privilege to be counted fit to, and worthy to be used by God in any way or form. Whether it's serving here in the church, uh, in a ministry, working with uh, our youth or our children or ushering in the parking lot or working in the media or Whatever it is, it's an honor and it's a privilege to be used of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. It says, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. And your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. Think about some of the things we used to do in our lives. They might have not been good works. God sees us, and he rescues us, and he saves us, and he puts his Holy Spirit within our lives, and he says, I got a plan and a purpose for you to do a good work. We're not saved by the good works that we do, but we are saved so that we can do good work, so that we can begin to bring hope uh, and encouragement uh, in the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that needs to hear it, especially in this day and age. God uses people that are filled with his Holy Spirit to, to reach others. The book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. You know, the disciples, they were ready to be used. They had been witness to the crucifixion of Jesus. They were witness to his resurrection. They ate with him and they talked with him after the resurrection. And they were given the mandate to go out into the world and, and make disciples of all nations. And they were ready. They were ready for the mandate. They were ready for the call of God upon their lives. But Jesus tells them in that first chapter, verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He tells them, And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of the earth, in Norwalk, okay. Los Angeles, Orange County, the state of California, United States, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico. It's anointed and Holy Ghost-filled people that God uses to reach the communities and to reach uh, one another. You know how he does it? He uses your testimony. He uses what he's uh, done and accomplished in your life. Your testimony is powerful. What, what God has done, what God has brought you out of, uh, the miracle that God has done in each and every one of you, it's powerful. And you might be thinking, you know, I don't really have much of a testimony. I wasn't maybe a bad person or I was raised in church and I've been here all my life and that's an awesome and that's a powerful testimony because it, it testifies of a living God that is able to keep a person. You know what your testimony is? It's powerful because you testify of a living God, of a mighty God, of a supernatural God, of a God that works uh, miracles. Your testimony is what the Holy Spirit anoints with his dunamis power, that dynamite power. You know, you might just be thinking, well, I don't really see that. You know, I'm just having a conversation with someone, maybe on the train or on the bus. I'm just telling them about what Jesus has done in my life. I maybe used to be a sinner. I used to be a smoker. I used to be a drinker, but Jesus set me free. Remember that song we used to sing, right? 
And you might be thinking, that's just a conversation. I'm just sharing with someone. Uh, you know, they came and they asked me, you know, how do you get through your day? I pray. And you're thinking, there's not much fire in that. But can I tell you, that's what's just taking place in the natural. But in the supernatural, in the supernatural, there's a move of God taking place. When you're sharing your testimony, what God has done, uh, Bible says chains are being broken. Strongholds are being broken. The enemy is being exposed, man. There is supernatural warfare going on in that simple conversation because truth is being spoken to whoever it is you're ministering to. It says we overcome him, the enemy, because of the blood of the lamb and because the word of our testimony, the word of the testimony. That's why the enemy fights some of you so hard from sharing your testimony. That's why the enemy will intimidate and, and keep you from opening your mouth and sharing the gospel and sharing the good news of Jesus with someone. Because he knows he's defeated once you begin to give God the glory. Once you begin to lift up the name of Jesus. Once you begin to shout the praises of the king, the enemy becomes defeated. He'll say, who are you? And don't let the enemy condemn you. I always say there's no condemnation in Christ. It's Christ that makes us holy. It's Christ that makes us righteous. We're righteous because of Jesus Christ. And that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit is that he draws us closer to him. And more than ever, we need to be drawing closer to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth. We're living in an era right now that... Uh, Evil is called good, and good is called evil, and right is called wrong, and wrong is called right, and up is down, and down is up. Uh, we hear all these kind of conflicting uh, messages on the media. It, it's, uh, they're telling you something, and it's going contrary to everything that you know is true. And understand uh, that uh, that's the strategy of the enemy. It's the strategy of the enemy to confuse someone, to sow seeds of doubt, to, to sow seeds of unbelief, and to get you to not understand and not believe the truth, especially when it comes to the truth of God's word. Someone said, truth is not easily found in a world where falsehoods and personal preferences are more often intriguing. Or excuse me, are often more intriguing. The Holy Spirit helps us uh, become captivated by truth uh, for the purpose of revealing Jesus in the, wor in the world. God's word is true. And you know the beauty of truth? Is that the truth is true whether we agree with it or not. Sometimes. There is a um, popular worldview, that postmodernism worldview where your truth might not be my truth and there is no absolute truth, but uh, in the light of God's word, we can understand that God's word is true and there is truth in God's word and there's power in the truth of, of God's word. And sometimes that truth might be offensive. And it's offensive because it deals with our pride. And it's offensive because it removes us from the throne and it places Christ back at the center where he belongs. In the book of John, chapter 6, Jesus here, he's talking about some hard truths. He had uh, just uh, performed a miracle where he fed the multitudes with just a few loaves of bread and some fish. And he begins to make the claim that he is the bread of life. That he is the bread of life, and it's through him that we're saved. It's through him we live, and it's through him that we have eternal life. And anything aside from him is just an empty religion. And people were being offended by that. People want to be right in their own eyes, and they don't want to be told uh, that there is only one way to the Father. And we, when we win people, we win them by telling them the truth in love. Seasoned with grace, as the Bible says. And what is that truth? The truth is, is that each and every one of us is a sinner. The Bible says we're all sinners. Our, our righteousness is like filthy rags. But because Jesus loved us so, so much, he willingly laid down his life uh, for each and every one of us. 
And when we call upon his name and we surrender our lives to him, uh, he's faithful to give us forgiveness and salvation and the promise of eternal life. Uh, that's the truth today. That's the gospel truth. Uh, that's the truth that changes people's lives. It's the truth that, that transforms an individual. Book of John, chapter 16, verse 13. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come, and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Holy Spirit, he, he enlightens our minds so that uh, we can know the word of God. Holy Spirit, he said to be the spirit of truth, and his ministry is to reveal truth uh, to you and I. Let me tell you why truth is so important and why the spirit of God will lead us to truth is because the Bible says it's the truth that sets us free. And sometimes the truth can hurt, but God uses that to bring healing. And even as uncomfortable as the truth might be sometimes, when we receive that truth and allow that truth to work in our lives, uh, healing can t take place. Restoration can take place. Truth, uh, it overcomes our fears and our worries. And truth reminds us that we're just walking. We're just walking through the valley of the shadow of death. That we don't have to fear evil because God is with us. The Bible says that we can be strong and courageous uh, because he is with us and he'll never leave us uh, nor forsake us. These are the promises that we have as believers. Uh, truth, it protects us from the enemy's deceit. It exposes the strategies and the weapons that he would try to form against us. It keeps us, it protects us. Truth will guide us to make right decisions for our lives. Be wise to learn to recognize and to listen to the Spirit of God. The Spirit, the Bible says, it's where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty, there's salvation, there's chains that are going to be broken. And as we listen and submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to His guiding, what begins to happen is uh, we begin to cultivate within our lives the ability to discern. That's why it's so important that we saturate ourselves with the word of God so we can discern what's right and what's wrong. So we can discern what is of God and what is not of God. So we can discern the will of God for our lives. When we study the word of God, you know what takes place is uh, there's a sanctification. There's a setting aside of our lives uh, that takes place and there's a protection that comes into our lives as we study the word of God. The word of God will begin to protect our thoughts and protect our minds and protect us uh, from making wrong decisions as we allow that word to penetrate our lives. Our minds become renewed and cleansed and we become ready to hear the voice of God. The book of John, Jesus was praying for his disciples. Chapter 17, verses 16 and 18. He's praying for his disciples and he, he was saying, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world sanctify them by your truth. He's saying, set them aside by your truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. We're not in heaven yet. We're still here on this earth, as Dean Braxton would say. Right? And Jesus said that he sends us as sheep among wolves. And that we're to be wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. And when he says that he sends us out as sheep among wolves, it's not so that he's setting us up for some failure to be slaughtered. But he's, he's saying, I've given you this authority and this power and this anointing in your life that you can contend with the wolves that you can deal with those that would want to come against you or your family, that you can deal with those that would want to come against the things of God, uh, that you don't have to cower or back down, but that there's an anointing, there's God on the inside, that when that wolf would come to try to intimidate or scare you, you can stand against them by the power and the anointing of God because of the security that you have as a believer, as a child of Christ.
God is so good, man. The Holy Spirit, he speaks to us. And he speaks to us the heart of Jesus. You know what the heart of Jesus is? It's people. It's people. Jesus died for, the, for a world that was dying, for a world that was headed to destruction. Jesus died for each and every one of us. And the Bible says that when we call upon his name, we'll be saved. That God wills that none would perish, but that all would come to a place of repentance. And I like what Pastor Matt always says. As long as there's breath in your lungs, there's hope for you. And you might be here tonight and you might be thinking, I've done some things in my life, man. You're breathing, there's hope for you. Jesus is, is the answer tonight. The Bible says that Jesus is truth and the Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying there's only one way to God the Father, and that's through, his, uh, through the Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why the Holy Spirit compels us to draw closer to Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit, uh, before we knew who, who Jesus personally, would deal with us and convict us and get us to that place uh, to come to a place in our lives where we would recognize the need for Jesus within our lives. Everything that the Holy Spirit does uh, is to draw our lives closer to Christ closer to Jesus. The closer we draw to Jesus, the, the more the Bible says we become like him. We take, we take on his character, his nature, his conduct. Our thoughts change. Our attitude changes. That's when you know you're saved, right? When your attitude starts changing. How we deal with people. People that might get under our skin or might come at us hard and we got to remember, I'm a Christian. I serve Jesus. Ouch, man. When I was about, I don't know, maybe 18, 19 years old, I wasn't saved yet. It was, it was close. I remember I uh, went to um, a music festival uh, Pretty popular one over here at Dominguez Hills, the, the college, Carson. And uh, I went with some friends, some friends that had come in from out of town. They had come in from, from, uh, from Texas, and they were staying with us. And we went to this music festival. And I remember that as we were walking to, to go in, there at the corner there was this little old man. He must have been about, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 years old. And please don't be offended if you're that age. Okay, I'm called old too. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? And he had this little stand, and he had a bunch of flyers. And then he had this, uh, these signs, you know, Jesus loves you, for God so loved the world. And, and he was just out there by himself witnessing. He was out there by himself ministering, telling all these hip hoppers and all these punk rockers and about the love of Jesus Christ. And one of the guys that was with us, I didn't know him too well. He was the brother of one of my friends. Um, he wasn't right. And he went to grab the flyers, and the gentleman stopped him. He says, I don't want you to throw these away. I don't want you to rip these up. So I'm giving them out. And uh, he said something to him, and grabbed all these flyers, and then just tossed them into the air. Threw them everywhere, flyers everywhere. And, you know, some people were laughing and, and mocking and ridiculing. I felt bad. I felt, uh, you know, um, ashamed and embarrassed that he would do this. Because here was this old man. He was just out there just trying to share the love of Jesus. And he began to pick up the flyers and put them back. You could, I could tell he was upset. And he just looked over at the dude and he says, God still loves you. God still loves you. And I thought, man, what a powerful witness. I didn't think it like that, but he made such an impact in my life because here he was unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, unashamed to tell people about the love of Jesus, unashamed to, to be out there by himself. Uh, he didn't have a whole outreach team with him. He was out there by himself uh, in enemy territory sharing Jesus Christ, sharing the love of God, giving us a warning 
And I thank God for that old man, that older gentleman. I found out years later that the individual that threw those flies, those flyers out in the air, he ended up dying of a, of a heroin overdose. God was using this gentleman to warn us. And I, I know he touched my life just by his testimony, just by his witness. I can imagine how many other individuals he made an impact on just by him showing people the way to Jesus. Matthew Henry said this. He says, those that are full of the Holy Spirit are fit for anything, either to act for Christ or to suffer for him. You know what else happens when you're full of the Holy Spirit? You become bold for Christ. You become bold for Christ, unashamed of the gospel. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 it says, this, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They were amazed. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. If we are going to reach our communities, our families, and our neighbors, and our loved ones, we're going to have to be bold for Christ. We're going to have to be unashamed of the, of the word of God. We're going to have to be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, some people might mock it. Some people might ridicule it. Some people might say it's foolish. Uh, but if you're a born-again believer, you know that the power of God is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's how men and women get saved. Uh, when they hear the good news of Jesus, when they hear the good news of a risen Savior, Something happens in a person's life, and they say, I want that. I want my sins forgiven. I want to be a child of God. The boldness comes only by spending time with Jesus, by being full of God's Holy Spirit. We have to remember that we don't serve a natural Jesus. We serve a supernatural Jesus. He is a supernatural Savior. The Bible says he made the blind see. He made the deaf hear. He made the lame walk. Uh, he worked miracles. Uh, he raised the dead. He healed the sick. Uh, he walked on water. He fed thousands with, just, uh, with nothing, with whatever was given to him. He cast out demons. He stilled the storms. He calmed the seas. We could kind of go on and on and on. We get the picture that he wasn't just uh, some natural hippie cult leader, but he was a risen, almighty king, almighty God, a supernatural Jesus, and it's, it's he who we belong to. We have a book of Acts. I read that already. No, I didn't. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 31. It says, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I think this past weekend, us having Dean Braxton here was God-ordained. Because he talked about an epicenter. He talked about this church here in Norwalk being an epicenter. That from this church, and I hope that that was caught. If not, I'll remind us that from this church, uh, oh, there's going to be a move of God, man. There's going to be a shaking, an awakening. There's going to be a move of God. Uh, but it takes you and I being bold and filled with the Holy Spirit and saying, here I am, God, use me. And it's going to take you and I uh, getting past our comfort zones uh, and saying, God, what is it that I can do? How can I help is what he said, right? We have an awesome opportunity this weekend to feed the need. It's the, it's the name of our outreach. We get to bring the good news to a community that really needs to hear some good news. We're going to go out into the streets, the highways and the byways, and we're not only going to take uh, the homeless community some food, some drinks, some apple pie or pumpkin pie, we're also going to take with them that bread of life, Jesus. And I want to encourage each and every one of you here, man. maybe you can't go out, but maybe you can contribute in some way or form. 
Maybe you can cook a turkey or bake a pie or buy one at Costco. You could talk to Pastor Reuben and let him know, man, I want to be a part of what God's going to do. That is a challenge. You might be saying, I wouldn't know what to say, though. I wouldn't know how to share. Book of Luke 12, verse 12, it says, The Holy Spirit will give you the right words when the time comes. When the time comes, you got to just trust in the Holy Spirit of God that he's going to give you those right words. You, a few years back, I was at a time where I was just kind of going through some things, and I was working out in Redondo Beach, and I wasn't too far from the ocean, so I figured I'd go sit at the bench and just read my Bible on my lunch break. And as I was reading, this gentleman came back my way, and he stopped, and he, was, and he saw that, he was, uh, that I was reading the Bible. And he began to speak to me, began to minister to me. And the things that he was saying were so spot on. This guy did not know me. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know anything about me. But everything that he was saying was perfect timing uh, for my life right then and right there. And I tell you why. Because that individual was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because God is on the inside of him. And because he was sensitive to the Spirit of God and sensitive to what God wanted to do in my life, he was able to go out of his way, spot me, and begin to minister to me and speak something into my life. You just got to allow the Spirit of God to have his way sometimes. So I bring this to a close, and our, and our worship team comes up. John is 15, verse 26. He says, but I send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, and he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. We've had an awesome series learning about the Holy Spirit. And how he's at work in our lives. And, and, and I hope what was stressed was the importance of partnering with the Holy Spirit. The importance of being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And allowing the Holy Spirit to have a greater influence in our lives. You look around and we could see the, the spiritual warfare taking place. We see it in the political climate. We see it... Uh, in the lives of individuals out in the streets that are struggling with whether it's drug addiction or mental illness we, we see what's taking place and God has equipped his church he's given us his Holy Spirit he's given us the truth he's given us his son Jesus and we can make an impact we we can be that light to, in the midst of darkness Been, we've been talking about the Spirit of God, and it really comes down to that relationship that we have with Him. That relationship that we have with the Holy Ghost. Allowing ourselves to be used by Him. And with our heads bowed tonight and our eyes closed,